thank you everybody for tuning in and choosing to spend your Monday evening, a beautiful Monday evening in fact, with me tonight. So wherever you are in the world, thank you for giving me your time. And time I will need because the subject that I'm going to be covering tonight is one that's very, very dear to my heart. And this is the incredible, vibrant period between the Boer War, fought between 1899 and 1902, and the First World War a gap of 19, between 1902 to 1914, the period indeed from Boer War to World War, a period I've written about widely and often spoken about, and a period which, in my opinion, is absolutely pivotal to the development of the British Army, not merely in the First World War, but indeed far beyond. And in fact, if we were to go back in time and we were to step back, say, to 1908, sometime in the Edwardian period, and we were to seize upon a, a local Briton and ask them about what they, what they thought about the war, undoubtedly they would refer to, the, they would understand intrinsically that we were referring to the Boer War, which was the, the fundamental conflict for Britain and indeed the wider empire in that 1902 to 1914 period. Of course, it would eventually be eclipsed by the great events of the First World War. But up until that point, the Boer War was a definitive, a defining, a reshaping process for the British Army and indeed the British nation. And over the next 60 minutes or so, I'm going to explore some of the pivotal aspects of how that this war changed Britain and particularly change the British Army. And I'm going to be facing on the tactical level of the British Army here, which is what I've written about most widely. But of course, in the q and I'd welcome wider questions if you wish to explore some of the strategic implications of this war, or indeed the cultural or political implications of the conflict. It is one that is rich for interpretation, and it's one that I think rewards study, and indeed is in need of greater study, in my opinion. A little bit of background first, because I do appreciate that not everybody is, is as familiar with the Boer War as uh, forebearers in the Edwardian period would have been. A brief summary of where and why this war was taking place requires reference to this map of South Africa as it stood at the eve of the Boer War in 1899. And the Boer War's origins stretched back centuries, and they stretched back to the mid-1600s when Dutch settlers had colonised the port that is now known as Cape Town and had claimed this vast area of southern Africa as their own as Cape Colony. Cape Town was a relatively small reprovisioning station for vessels that were heading to and from the Dutch East Indies and it struggled to attract immigration. Because it struggled to attract immigration it fairly rapidly developed its own unique identity and by the mid 1700s so about a century after its founding the Dutch settlers there were referring to themselves no longer as Dutch but instead as Afrikaners quite literally Africans and they had a quite fiercely independent outlook the kind that's associated with life on the frontier. The, these fiercely independent settlers came under British rule at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Britain had seized Cape Town in 1806 to prevent it being used as a base for French naval vessels, and the control of Cape Colony was confirmed at the end of the Napoleonic Wars when this area was annexed by the British. This brought Britain and Africana, or even by this stage more commonly known as Boers, word simply means farmer in Afrikaans, brought Britain and Boer into close proximity, and immediately the two groups chafed against one another. The Boers and the Britain, Britons did not share a language, they did not share a legal system, they did not have a similar culture, and they did not even have the same interpretation of the Bible, the Boers being very much in favour of an old-fashioned, an Old Testament style of religion, whereas the British, of course, had a rather more New Testament outlook. These problems developed from 1815 into the 1830s when the British decision to abolish slavery around the empire was finally proved to be too much for the Boer settlers in Cape Colony who were a slaveholding society and news of this they decided a large number of them in fact perhaps as many as 20,000 of them decided this was simply too much and that they needed to find their own homelands. This led to a process known as the Great Trek a march across southern Africa looking for new territories, which eventually, after various um, wars, adventures, and indeed incidents, led to the Boers founding two republics, the Orange Free State here and the Transvaal, somewhat larger to the north. Independent states, but closely allied. 
The British continued to have an adversarial relationship with the Boers. There was wars between Britain and the new states in the 1840s, and a very significant war indeed fought between 1880 to 81, known as the First Boer War, in which remarkably, at least from a British perspective, the Boers defeated the British army in February uh, 1881 at a battle, the Battle of Majuba Hill. And the victory at Majuba Hill actually led to a political compromise which ensured Boer independence. And there, the story may well have ended, had it not been for the fact that the Boers soon after discovered the world's largest gold and diamond deposits lay within their territory, making these two small agrarian states two of the richest states proportionately in the entire world. And this occurring at the height of the scramble for Africa, it's occurring at a time when European powers are squabbling for influence in this continent, it was almost inevitable that Britain would end up going to war once more with the Boer Republics to seize these mineral assets. We don't need to talk too long about the road, the road to war. The important part is that by October 1899, the Boer Republics felt they'd been backed into a corner by British political and military pressure, and that their only option was to declare war and actually try and strike a preemptive blow against the British before they succumbed to the inevitable invasion. And therefore, the Boer, the Boer War, or more rightly, the Second Boer War, broke out in October 1899 as the Boers fought for their independence once more. And the date's significant because October 1899 is, of course, the spring in South Africa. The seasons are reversed from North to Southern Hemisphere. And it gave rise in Britain to the saying, this will all be over by Christmas, a saying that we most closely associate, incorrectly as it is, with 1914. Very little evidence that this was announced or pronounced in 1914, but I can assure you it was pronounced in October 1899. And that gives you some indication of the mood with which Britain went to war with the Boers, one of overwhelming confidence. But the British should have been cautious about their opponents, not least because, of course, the Boers had previously defeated the British army in the early 1880s, so nearly 20 years before this new war. A picture here, an iconic picture, in fact, of Boer fighters, Boer riflemen, gathering together in the early stages of the war. Know the fact they lack a uniform, they're wearing their own civilian clothes. And this is because, of course, the Boers did not have a standing army. The Boer military system had developed since the 1600s into a militia system. There was no standing army, but in times of crisis, the militia would be called out. And the militia called upon all able-bodied males aged between 16 and 60 to muster for service, bringing with them a firearm, a horse, and rations. And if you couldn't provide any of those things for any reason, the Boer governments having wisely invested their mineral wealth would provide you with them. And in fact, in 1899, as the Boer militia mustered, their rifles, their weapons that they brought, often quite old weapons, were replaced with modern German Mauser rifles, which had been specially imported by the Boer government just for this particular occasion. Assembling a militia of men aged between 16 and 60 was on the surface not an especially promising set of circumstances. These units arrived, they formed themselves around the district in which they'd arrived in, and they elected their own officers. But the Boers had certain cultural attributes which actually made them formidable opponents for the British army. The first of these cultural aspects was the Boers' fascination with marksmanship and indeed its rifle culture. The rifle was a means and a metaphor for independence in South Africa at this time. It was a means because you would use a rifle to defend yourself and to defend your family. This is still a frontier society with bands of outlaws, not to mention hostile natives, the Zulus, the Khursa and more besides. It was a means to protect your family, therefore. It was a means to hunt. There was widespread game in South Africa, so you could feed your family with it. And it was a metaphor to indicate that you were coming of age. And in fact, in Boer society, it was very common for boys in their teenage years, as they reached 14 usually, to be presented with their first firearm and taught how to use it. And so the, the rifle had tremendous cultural and practical significance for the Boers. And it meant that most Boers had some skill with it. Even city-dwelling Boers, and Boer cities were growing as a result of the mining boom, kept up their rifle skills because it was culturally significant. It was very popular, for example, to take part in marksmanship contests. And one British observer passing through the Boer Republics shortly before the war, as he noted that marksmanship competitions for the Boers occupied the same place that playing billiards did 
uh, in London back in the UK, which gives you some idea about the popularity of rifle shooting as a pastime. And so though these men did not have formal training in the use of their weapons, they made up for it by having a cultural background and an, almost a natural affinity for the use of rifles. Added to this was the Boer's tremendous mobility. You'll recall that they had to assemble at their command, their, um, command posts with a horse. More correctly, a pony. The Boers made wide use of ponies, which were the descendants of horses that had been brought to South Africa when the colony was originally settled. These were hardy mounts that were capable of eating the South African foliage, uh, moving through great heat and carrying their rider without becoming exhausted. This combination, therefore, of marksmen with cultural affinity for rifles, all mounted, created an extraordinarily mobile boar force that could move from one position, dismount, defend it with their rifles, and then remount and move to the next if they're in danger of being overrun. It made them extremely mobile, but also comparatively heavily armed. And they backed up this armament with the only professional branch of the Boer military, the Stats Artillery, or the State Artillery, which was professional gun, consisted of professional full-time artillerymen who were equipped with the latest imported guns from France and Germany that in some cases actually were um, technically superior to those being deployed by the British. This gave the Boers a wide range of fighting assets and the Boers would prove themselves formidable opponents for the British in this conflict and as many of you know because it's a story I often tell but I'll reiterate just in case you haven't heard it before the testament to the toughness of the Boers comes from the fact that Winston Churchill, in the summer of 1940, when he founded Britain's first special forces, the Commandos, he chose their name from the Boers. A Boer military unit was called a Commando, and it has no great connotation in the Africana language. It's the same as saying a unit or a battalion or a regiment. But Churchill remembered how tough these men had been, especially in the guerrilla stages of the war that would follow, and he wanted to try and connect their toughness, resilience, refusal to give in to Britain's modern special forces. And I don't think there can be a greater testament to how tough the Boers were in this conflict than that fact. And of course, to this day, we still possess in Britain the Royal Marine Commandos. Against this, the British could approach the war with confidence because of their own experiences. And you just going back to the idea that the British thought this war would be over by Christmas, this was not entirely hubristic. This actually had some grounds in the previous British experiences in colonial wars. And Britain was phenomenally experienced in colonial fighting up to this point. In fact, the Boer War, or the Second Boer War, was the 226th war that had been fought a colonial war that had been fought during the reign of Queen Victoria. In total, there will be 230 such wars, so a remarkable record of combat. And the British Army had emerged successfully from the majority of these wars. In fact, we tend to fixate on defeats, such as Izandwala at the hands of the Zulus or Maywand at the hands of the Afghans, precisely because they were so unusual and that they left a cultural mark upon British memory, whereas the many victorious wars the British Army fought were largely forgotten. The British Army's approach to colonial warfare was firmly based upon close control, discipline, physical fitness, improvised logistics, and volley firing. And all of these factors played an important role when fighting against colonial opponents, such as the Zulus, the Mahdists, or even certain forces of Afghanistan that tended to rush against the British, trying to get into close combat. And standing firm, maintaining strict formations, and delivering volley fire was absolutely essential to overcome this. You may hear a phone ringing in the background. You'll have to excuse me. It's going to ring until it finishes. But we're going to continue. The Volley fire and the strict discipline was essential, therefore, to stand off against individually brave but otherwise disorganised forces. But it locked the British Army into a fairly rigid form of thinking and a fairly rigid approach to tactics, which was suitable when fighting poorly armed opponents, but was, as we will see, to prove a, a detrimental approach when fighting the much more wily and skilled fighters of the Boers. And the British didn't have long to experience this firsthand. Early battles inclined against the British. And though th this was by no means one-sided fighting, the British also won victories in this combat. It was, the, by and large, battles that were costly for the British, even if they were successful. And in other cases, ended in outright defeats. 
exemplified by the period in mid-December 1899, when three separate British armies were defeated in individual battles in a period that became known as Black Week between the 10th of December and the 15th of December. And a picture of one of those battles here, the Battle of Stormberg, uh, with the Northumberland Fusiliers there trying to storm a defended hilltop and unfortunately being mown down by Boer riflemen. And this act was in many ways the story of the early part of the Boer War and indeed uh, would continue for some time in the conflict. Described by British journalist uh, L.M. Phillips, attached to the uh, one British army operating around Orange Free State or near Orange Free State, Describing an early battle, he commented, and indeed he was watching it from a hilltop, described it as nothing but an honest, straightforward British march up to a row of waiting rifles. And of course, the consequences for this were often severe. Close order formations, which had been so effective against the Zulus and the Mardists, and indeed others, proved a liability in South Africa. They were an ideal target for the Boers, who were often occupying defended carefully defended positions, which they'd occupied with their greater mobility. And then using their rifles with skill, the Boers could pour fire into the densely packed British assault lines, inflicting heavy losses at battle after battle. And even battles would end in victory. And Graspan, which Phillips was at, did actually end in a British victory. Nevertheless, the cost was always far more severe to the British attackers than it had been to the Boers. And this process couldn't last. In fact, the defeats at Black Week in December uh, 1899 were all characterized by bungled British assaults into Boer defensive positions, which were then pinned down, mown down, and often in, in several cases actually ended with British forces uh, being routed effectively, just forced back by fire, having lost their officers and NCOs and in a state of confusion. And this experience of suddenly assaulting well-entrenched, well-positioned enemy riflemen showed some of the problems with British tactics and raised questions about how this could be solved. One of the obvious ways to solve this was to revise assault tactics, to adopt tactics that were more skirmishers style. So moving forward in bounds, going from cover to cover, perhaps using trenches or digging in uh, as and when necessary. And using the, the general term for this type of activity was field craft, understanding how the terrain fitted around you, how you could utilize it to your advantage, coordinating with others and coordinating your movements. That was an obvious solution to this type of assault, but the British Army was very poorly trained in field craft entering into the Boer War. And this was exemplified by the comments of Sir Henry Colville, commander of the elite First Guards Brigade, who admitted after the war to a post-war Elgin inquiry, at first, officers and men were very stupid about taking cover. And he actually went on to relate a, an anecdote where he, he'd seen one of his own units stood in formation atop a ridge in full view of the enemy, being gunned down, in fact, by enemy rifle fire, and they wouldn't take cover, or his soldiers, I should say, would not take cover because nobody had ordered them to take cover. And so they simply stood there and took totally needless casualties. And we do read of examples of this where troops who'd simply never been trained to dive behind rocks or hide in long grass were left bewildered uh, about how to do it. They become confused. And unless somebody pointed out exactly where they were to take their position, they would often stumble around uh, hide behind inadequate objects or sometimes not hide uh, hide behind anything and furthermore even if british soldiers did take cover they had a terrible habit of then when they needed to fire rising up exposing the top half of their body which made them an easy target for boar marksmen and of course what made this uh, firing from behind cover all the harder was the british emphasis on volley fire very closely controlled reliant upon an officer to direct where that fire would go, call out the ranges, call out the targets, and indeed count down, effectively organize when the soldiers would pull their trigger. This suddenly became impossible, or at least extremely hard to implement, with soldiers scattered about, hiding behind rocks and bushes. These soldiers proved unable to carry out individual marksmanship. They would their firing was often extraordinarily wild. They weren't changing their sights on their rifles because nobody was giving them order to. And all this contributed to make British infantry assaults often very ineffective, struggling to take cover, struggling to move forward, struggling to provide covering fire so other groups could move, uh, resulting, of course, in 
attacks becoming bogged down. And although this might prevent you from suffering the heavy losses that the British suffered initially trying to assault directly into Boer positions, it nevertheless was not successful in actually getting into those enemy positions and driving the Boers back. And entrenchment too was fairly basic. We've got a, a picture here, a photograph here of the British in the typical type of um, trench that was found in the Boer War, completely straight, very easy to enfilade, and indeed this did occur uh, most notably, of course, at the Battle of Spion Kop, the bloodiest single day of the war in January 1900. So infantry was having all sorts of problems, and it gradually mastered these problems. It gradually overcame them by adopting better skirmish tactics, bitter experience taught the soldiers how to move, uh, there was better coordination with other arms. But this took a long time, and it took a large number of British lives before the lesson was fully absorbed. And it wasn't merely the infantry that was having problems, it was also the British cavalry. Now, South Africa was in some ways an ideal war for mounted troops. We've already heard how the Boers were, of course, a fully mounted force, extraordinarily mobile, and fairly quickly the British realised they would need to match or perhaps even exceed that mobility if they were ever going to bring this war to a conclusion. But there were a number of problems with the British cavalry uh, that initially went out to South Africa. And one of the problems which seems so obvious to us now, but reflects something, I think, of the disorganisation that attended elements of this war, was that British cavalry sent from the UK in the early stage of the war left a northern hemisphere winter and travelled straight into a southern hemisphere summer. Uh, and of course, the poor horses suffered dreadfully. Furthermore, the British cavalry proved itself extremely poor at the skill that was known at the time as horse mastery, the ability to look after your horse, to feed it, to groom it, to clean it, to understand how to rest it, to understand the need to dismount and walk alongside it from time to time, and a thousand and other, uh, other important elements about horse care. And this cartoon, this parody, uh, exemplifies much of the attitude uh, and much of the approach that British cavalry had in the Boer War. You've got an enormous oversized man riding on a horse that's actually half his size. And of course, this is billed as heavy cavalry. And this indeed was the experience of horses. So William Robertson, who of course you may know as the chief of the Imperial General Staff uh, between 1916 and 19, the early 1918, he, was, he commented afterwards that no more wretched beast ever lived than the horses on the advance to Pretoria, which was occurring in about mid-1900. And that advance into Boer territory towards the Transvaal capital of Pretoria was attended by the most appalling horse attrition amongst the British cavalry. Uh, expenditure of horses was appalling in this war, uh, running well over 200,000 horses and mules in the euphemistic phrase the British War Office expended in the conflict. But of course, this often meant they'd been ridden to death, they'd been inadequately cared for, they'd not been fed properly, uh, which frequently left the British cavalry with nowhere to go and very little to do, and indeed did tremendous damage to the cavalry's reputation. And so you can see that there were a host of problems that, that were attending the British army in South Africa. The army gradually overcame most of these. It gradually learned how to assault Boer positions. It gradually learned how to coordinate its attacks and use covering fire. The cavalry and mounted force of the British army gradually got better at maintaining their horses and understanding how to maneuver around the terrain. But this process took a long time and it cost a lot of lives. Total British casualties in South Africa, about 100,000 men of whom perhaps 22,000 died, uh, including a large number who died of disease in that theatre. The, by the end of the war, large parts of South Africa have been devastated, of course, by the British scorched earth policy. The British reputation internationally had been badly besmirched by its use of concentration camps uh, to house Boer women and children who'd been uh, left homeless by the British decision to burn Boer farms and villages. And the British Exchequer had been forced to pay millions of pounds to sustain a bitter and bloody war. And if we remember that in October 1899, there were those in the British press who thought it would all be over by Christmas. When the war finally came to an end in May 1902, it was clear that those predictions had been severely wide of the mark. And that although the British Army may have learned how to fight in South Africa, there was still so much more that it had to absorb from this conflict. 
And this attitude was exemplified by this po a poem, and I've been just included a verse from it rather than the full poem. You're welcome to look that up if you're interested. By Rudyard Kipling, and the uh, Kipling's poem was simply called The Lesson, and it, typical Kipling style. Uh, this verse, I thought, catches something of the mood that gripped Britain after the war. Let us admit it fairly, as a business people should. We have had no end of a lesson. It will do us no end of good. Not on a single issue or in one direction or twain, but conclusively, comprehensively, and several times and again. And this reflected, this poem reflected an attitude towards the Boer War in its aftermath as it finished in mid-1902 that showed its importance to British society. This war had repercussions both politically, economically, socially, and culturally. It was a pivotal event in the history of the British Empire in particular. But for the British Army, more so, I think, than perhaps any other single institutional organization in Britain at the time, the British Army was painfully aware of what it had experienced in this conflict. It had gone to war with a strong sense of hubris, uh, uh, or for the very least significant overconfidence. It had had bruising encounters, bruising combat with the Boers who it had once underestimated but later of course would come to greatly respect. It was concerned about the casualties it had suffered, it was concerned about the inadequacy of some British equipment which had been revealed as being inadequate for the conditions of modern warfare and above all else it was worried about what a future war might look like. There's the British army which had of course been the victor on dozens, hundreds in fact of, of colonial battlefields over the last few decades had suddenly run into an opponent armed with modern weaponry, modern rifles and a small up but significant amount of modern artillery. And it, the British Army had found that its tactics and its approach to war had been completely inadequate, not completely inadequate, but significantly uh, problematic when dealing with modern weaponry. And this, of course, raised an alarming possibility that if Britain was suddenly called upon to fight against a European opponent, and at this stage in 1902, the most likely opponent was Russia, who, of course, eyed India with envious eyes, Britain was forced to fight against a modern European opponent armed to a similar standard, or indeed a better standard than the Boers, it was quite likely the British army was going to find itself in severe trouble. And one of the political legacies of the Boer War was the revelation about how isolated Britain was diplomatically and strategically. The European powers looked upon Britain with schadenfreude, shameful joy, enjoying Britain's agony in South Africa for three years, uh, promoting, in fact, uh, the Boer cause within Europe, raising money for it, indeed, in some cases, sending out volunteer commandos of their own to join the Boer fight. And at one point, in fact, Kaiser Wilhelm II uh, suggested, perhaps, more to cause mischief than with any great intention behind it. But nevertheless, he suggested that Germany, France and Russia, of course, historic enemies, combined and actually forced Britain to the negotiating table and forced Britain to negotiate a settlement with the Boers. Politically, this didn't occur, but the fact that the suggestion had been made at all alarmed Britain greatly. And it worried that the, the British government worried that the revelation of British military weakness might embolden Russia, which at the time was the main enemy, of course, uh, for Britain. And this political background and a strategic background added to the army's worries. This was not an academic question of thinking, well, things have gone wrong in South Africa. How can we change them? What can we do to make this better? Instead, there was an imperative to change rapidly, just in case the changed situation in the world would lead to a, the British Army silly being thrown into a new conflict against an opponent that was mo uh, equipped with modern weapons. And so this gave an energy to British Army changes and reforms, which helped them take hold. Richard Kipling's poem was called The Lesson, but of course, as we've just seen in his verse, he actually identified or commented that there were many lessons that could be drawn from the conflict. And he was, of course, right. For the purposes of this talk, I want to fixate on a single lesson that the British Army learned and absorbed, and which would form the cornerstone of its tactical approach from 1902 to 1940, and indeed beyond and into the First World War. And that lesson was firepower. We have a picture here. This is a painting of Canadian soldiers fighting at the Battle of Paderberg in February 1900. 
Why firepower? It's because firepower lay at the heart of all tactical lessons that the British Army absorbed from South Africa. Firepower, quite simply, had changed everything. Encountering Boer riflemen who were armed with the same rifle that the German army was equipped with, the Mauser, a magazine-loading rifle capable of delivering a high rate of fire with considerable accuracy at long range, not to mention the shelling of Boer artillery, showed the incredible overwhelming force that firepower could develop. And remember, the Boers were not a large army, perhaps. At the height of the Boer War, the Boers could muster perhaps between 55 and 60,000 fighting men, but in reality, their combat effectives were probably close to 35,000. So the Boer army was small, and yet it was still able to generate terrific amounts of fire from its rifles and its artillery. What kind of firepower might a European army generate in return? And so firepower lay at the heart of all this. It was the British Army's first real experience with mass firepower, fighting against mass modern firepower. And it was a lesson that stuck. And as we'll see, it was this lesson, the, the dangers of firepower, that would inform the entire tactical approach the British Army developed after the Boer War. There were clear implications for both attack and defence. To attack, as I've previously discussed, would now require widely extended lines, skirmish lines, as you might call it, with wide gaps between soldiers, perhaps as much as six to eight paces per man. But in the Boer War, it'd even be even greater. For example, the Battle of Diamond Hill in 1900, British infantry attacked extended to an astonishing 30 paces between each man. This, of course, made individual soldiers a much smaller target. It allowed them to use cover more intelligently once they learned, of course, this important skill. Uh, and it allowed them to keep moving without being providing a, a, a choice target for Boer firepower. Widely extended lines became essential for any British assault. But more than just that, simply being widely extended on its own, although advantageous, made you smaller targets, made you harder to be picked off, that alone did not do enough to allow you to advance. Once you got to close range, the Boers would still be able to put down such a withering hail of fire you could no longer move. The missing ingredient was covering fire. The British learned to their cost that once they got to close range, perhaps 200, uh, perhaps 300 yards from a Boer position, Boer fire redoubled its efforts, it became more accurate, and the only way to continue to advance was to find a way to suppress it either by British infantry providing covering fire, blasting at the Boers to keep their heads down, or British artillery dropping shells and bursting shrapnel just above the Boer trenches to cause them to duck down to allow the British to move forward dash by dash until eventually they would close to a position where they could force the Boers up from the position that they were holding. This was a complicated process, but it was one that was absolutely necessary. British attempts to attack in fairly dense formations early in the war had simply led to very heavy losses. So to attack required these new tactics and to defend two required new tactics. The British Army had gained limited experience defending against the Boers in South Africa. There had been some defensive British battles, but in general, the Boers had been disinclined towards close combat for cultural reasons. But nevertheless, the British recognised the power the Boers had developed in their own defensive methods, which had exemplified concealment, use of cover, hiding behind rocks, anthills, trees, anything that could be found, and entrenchment. In particular, Boer entrenchment fascinated the British. The Boers, using, it must be said, impressed African labour to dig their trenches, had been capable of constructing complex and sophisticated earthworks that had proved very resilient to British shelling and provided excellent cover for Boer riflemen fighting from within them. When entrenchment was not available to the Boers, perhaps they hadn't had time to set it up, Boer marksmen proved adept at hiding themselves in tall grass in the foliage of South Africa or hiding themselves behind rocks, inclines in the ground and more besides. They had an almost natural ability and natural affinity for reading the ground. And this, of course, made assaulting these positions very, very difficult. You couldn't see where the enemy was. When you did get close to him, it's difficult to engage him because he was using cover or he was in trenches, which, of course, reduced your own firepower. And the British recognised that this, this use of defensive positions, 
as exemplified by the Boers, could be adopted, of course, into the British Army. And indeed, it would become necessary to adopt into the British Army. The British had relatively little experience facing Boer artillery. There were only a handful of battles where Boer artillery really made its presence felt. But those battles had shown the potential annihilating fire that even a handful of modern guns could develop and showed that the solution to that was to make sure you were well entrenched to protect yourself from shell bursts. What this meant beyond all this, though, these are, of course, battlefield specific to attack or to defend. These were combined, though, in the almost the watchword of British tactics or the watchwords, I should say, of British tactics in the pre First World War period, which was fire and movement. And the two had become intrinsically linked. When the British Army went into the Boer War, I would argue that they tended to exemplify or, or identify the fact that movement was essential, but they didn't understand that movement had to be covered by and indeed prepared by fire. Simply marching into a row of Boer rifles, as we heard from the journalist Phillips at the Battle of Graspan, was a recipe for disaster. The only way you could move was by using firepower to suppress the defenders. But if you, didn't, if you did suppress the defenders by firepower but didn't move, then you would simply lead to indecisive, quite often long-range fighting. And instead, the two had to be combined. And this leads to fire and movement. The movement of one group of attackers is covered by the fire of a second group. And then when the first group is in position, it opens fire and allows its comrades to move up in bounds. And here we have, ladies and gentlemen, in fact, the essence of modern infantry assault tactics which we still see in the 21st century. And this, although not an entirely new lesson to the British, remember they had gradually developed this in South Africa, fighting the Boers, this was developed greatly in the intervening years between 1902 and 1914, and would be the linchpin of everything the British Army looked at. So fire and movement had to be developed. So the lesson, the first lesson that had to be grasped was how to develop the British Army's own firepower. I've got a picture here of soldiers undergoing musket, musketry training. And the British grasped this concept of the need to improve its own firepower very quickly. And there were several important changes to the British Army's equipment at this time. Perhaps most famously or, or most memorably, the British Army adopted new rifles for the infantry and the cavalry. In the South African War, the cavalry had used a carbine, a shortened version of a rifle that had proved hopelessly inadequate in combat with the Boers. It was short-ranged, it was inaccurate, it was essentially useless. This short magazine Lee Enfield, an iconic rifle, the SMLE, it would serve the British Army for decades from this point in various variations, solved the problem of the carbine because it was a rifle that was small and handy enough that it could be used by both the cavalry uh, and the infantry. And yet it had the accuracy, the stopping power, and the rapidity of fire uh, that a standard rifle would have. It was an ideal weapon for the British Army. And of course, they were both infantry and cavalry were now equipped with this, with the expectation they would use these new effective rifles to develop their own rifle firepower. And it meant that training for marksmanship, for musketry, as it was called at the time, emphasized rapidity, accuracy, and range. Something that had shocked the British in South Africa was the rapidity of, of magazine rifle fire, that in the hands of a skilled rifleman, it could easily uh, squeeze off shot after shot after shot with only brief pauses to load a new magazine. But what had really shocked the British in South Africa was not so much the rapidity of fire, but the astonishing accuracy of Boers, or at least certain elite Boer marksmen who really were tremendous shots and were able to pick off British officers, um, the, uh, significant figures such as uh, machine gunners or signalers could be picked off. And indeed, anybody showing their head over cover was at risk from these crack shots. And so accuracy of fire was just as important as rapidity. And finally, there was range. And the British Army was shocked by the range which the Boers would open fire with their rifles in South Africa, often well over a thousand yards. And although individual shots at this range without telescopic sights were largely a matter of luck, nevertheless, they could slow down in advance and start to inflict distant casualties. And all this meant that the British revised the way they approached the use of the rifle. Whereas before the Boer War, 
The emphasis had been on closely controlled volley fire with an officer or an NCO in position to shout out the range to the men as they began to open fire. After this point, the emphasis was on training individual soldiers to be skilled riflemen, able to fire rapidly, accurately, and engage an enemy at long range. And indeed, the British anticipated the possibility of engaging the enemy as distant as 1,400 yards away, if the circumstances permitted, but saw the really decisive range as being within about 300 yards when the enemy will be close enough for you to see them and engage them uh, properly. And that's where your rapidity and your accuracy as a marksman would really be tested. The British infantry and the cavalry underwent the same marksmanship course. Unusually, the British emphasised cavalry marksmanship just as much as the British and the infantry. And this set them apart, of course, from European armies. European armies at the time still armed their cavalry with carbines. The exemplar of the British revision to musketry training and its desire to capture fire and to control firepower is given by the famous Mad Minute exercise, a training exercise in which an individual soldier would be required to fire 15 rounds from his Lee Enfield at a target 300 yards distant with a clock set for 60 seconds. And <clears throat> This, uh, this exercise became quite iconic. It was made more complicated by the fact that the soldier was only allowed to start with five rounds in his magazine and then only reload in five round increments, which added a certain complexity. But it became almost the defining feature of British musketry. And high scores in the Mad Minute exercise were rewarded with superior pay and often uh, informal prizes, such as bottles of beer and so on, given to the best shooting men in the company or the battalion. And it led to very fierce competition amongst soldiers for who could be the best marksman. And in fact, marksmanship competitions in the British Army became so popular by the eve of the First World War and were attracting so many entrants that the army itself was complaining they were essentially unmanageable. Too many men were arriving to participate in the competitions and there wasn't enough time for them to shoot at the range properly, and it made running them very difficult. And this is captured, I think, by the Mad Minute. It's often said that the Mad Minute was something the British infantry used all the time. It's not true. This was an exercise that was carried out by all British soldiers, but in battlefield terms, it was something to be used in extreme emergencies when an absolute blizzard of fire was required. It was not something that was used in standard practice, because, of course, you'd simply blast away all your ammunition and be left high and dry. But the fact that it was carried out and that it became so popular and that it has left something of a cultural memory, even to this day, I think gives you some idea about how committed British infantrymen and indeed cavalrymen were to mastering their rifles and learning the lesson of firepower. It wasn't simply the infantry that were absorbing the lessons of firepower. The artillery was also undergoing a reformation and was being equipped with new artillery pieces, the heaviest, in fact, in their class in Europe. And this led to a wholesale rearmament of the Royal Artillery um, in the years after the Boer War. Older, inadequate guns were mothballed. They were given to the territorials. And instead, the regular army adopted iconic uh, firing pieces that would become important in the First World War. The 13-pounder for the horse artillery, the 18-pounder for the field artillery, and the 60-pounder for the Royal Garrison Artillery. And the 60-pounder was Britain's first mobile heavy gun. And it was based, the, uh, indeed, the concept of the 60-pounder was based upon bore uh, 155 millimeter guns known as long toms which had caused such a stir in Britain. The British added to this at the end of the period the 4.5 inch howitzer, another highly effective field piece and again uh, the heaviest in its class in Europe. Why the heaviest in the class? It, the British army went for this because the lesson of the Boer War seemed to suggest two things. The first was that artillery was actually more mobile than the army had expected. Um, with skilled detachments, it could move pretty quickly and get into good positions. And secondly, the overriding lesson was that it was better to go for a heavy shell that did serious damage than a light gun that would have to fire uh, double the number of shells to inflict the same level of harm upon its opponents. And so after a long debate, the British chose to go with the heaviest field guns in their class, again, recognizing the importance of firepower. And all this meant, was that the British Army could generate much more firepower 
1940 than in 1899 from its own artillery, which was now heavier, uh, indeed better trained, better equipped, and of course from its own infantry and cavalry, who were now had a much higher standard of marksmanship, greater understanding of how to use their firearms, and the ability in extremists to deliver truly scorching tornadoes of rifle fire uh, in the event of a crisis. So the army had certainly learned much of its lessons about fire, though as we'll see in a little while, it didn't learn all the lessons perhaps it could have done. But what of movement? Well, of course, movement had to be allied to fire. We've already heard that. We've already established this picture of some British scouts, cavalry scouts, on manoeuvres prior to the First World War here. I've mentioned before, and let's reiterate this point, that fire and movement became the cornerstone of British assault tactics. And this was studied, discussed, and it was trained in the 1902 to 1914 period. And problems were, in fact, observed. And one of the common problems was soldiers tending to become bogged down in firefights and not understanding the need to keep moving to allow groups to keep pressing forward. And that was something that the army trained very hard to try and overcome this tendency for firing lines to become bogged down in training and to encourage them to move to provide fire to cover each other and this sometimes leads to a confusion in particular comments that are sometimes taken wildly out of context where British officers are talking about victories is are won by the bayonet and there's a quote from Lancelot Kidgel that's often cited uh, uh, during this period to show the British army were backward that quote is always taken out of context it's always misrepresented because what Kitchell is actually doing is he's giving confirmation at a general staff conference to the idea that movement has to be uh, has to follow fire, that fire alone cannot win a battle. You cannot simply shoot an enemy out of a trench. At some point, you've got to get close to him. And Kitchell is giving People had already argued this point at the conference, and Kijel, in his own way, was confirming him, saying, you've got to be in range to threaten the enemy with a physical assault, i.e. use your bayonets, to make him retreat or to make him uh, give ground to you. Otherwise, you're never going to capture those positions. And so combining these two, the fire, which you've just heard about, allowing movement to take place was essential, and the movement element had to be trained quite hard because it's quite natural for soldiers to want to stay behind cover and simply deliver fire and the army struggled at times to overcome this tendency and it had to be trained uh, long and hard to master. The army also had other uh, movement elements and one of these was the reform of cavalry. Now we heard earlier about how uh, what a nightmare the cavalry had had in, in many ways in South Africa. Horses dying, its mobility being lost, heavy men riding uh, increasingly uh, drained and suffered suffering horses. This was widely reformed after the Boer War. The cavalry perhaps had the most criticism from the press and from the public in the aftermath of the Boer War and had to react quickly to this criticism. And this led to, as well as a re-equipment with a Lee Enfield rifle we've just heard about, it also led to a complete reconsideration of the skills of horse mastership, how to care for a horse, how to look after a horse on campaign and things like removing the saddle, walking alongside the horse, understanding how to feed it, water it, care for it, and a thousand and one other small details. Because we're, it's easy for us to forget, it's one thing to care for a horse in the stables, it's a very different task to care for a horse in the field. And this was the problem the British had had in South Africa. This was now uh, removed. Cavalry training strongly emphasized the care and condition of their horses and understanding what would drain a horse and what a horse could and could not do. And cavalry was going to be the most mobile aspect of the British Army at this stage. Of course, it's long before motorized, uh, sorry, mechanized warfare. The tank is still several years away. Um, and so cavalry is the most mobile aspect. And to encourage cavalry mobility, the horses had to stay healthy. And so this became a watchword of British cavalry training. But more than that, the cavalry also recognized that by often leading the army, it would find itself in positions where it might have to engage in a firefight, might have to dismount, as the Boers were so skilled at in the South Africa, or it might actually be able to have to launch a mounted charge with sword or perhaps even Lance. And so it trained for both these roles so that it could seize opportunities as and when they were required. The cavalry itself was organized to be not just a shock arm, one that was going to charge into the enemy, but was also reorganized to be an excellent scouting force with lots more emphasis placed on the ability of the cavalry to carry out reconnaissance. And that's not merely seeking out the enemy and finding them, it's also protecting 
the rest of the British Army from incoming enemy reconnaissance. And the army trained extremely hard in these roles, and indeed, I'd argue, was close to mastering them by the edge of the First World War. The mobility of the cavalry uh, was matched in many ways by the mobility of the infantry, which emphasized hard marching and physical fitness, uh, and indeed, in some ways, represented a light infantry force that could move quickly, could uh, be, be landed somewhere, move quickly, and take good positions. And this was because the army was small. Uh, by European standards, it was tiny. Of course, the British Army at this stage, an all-volunteer army, uh, with its size largely capped uh, by financial constraints. So in total, in Britain, perhaps 120,000 regular soldiers at any one time, which compared very unfavorably to the million-man armies that France and Germany could raise in wartime. Lacking size and weight, the British Army would have to make up for it with mobility. And <clears throat> it hoped that it could outmaneuver its enemies, it could get into the positions it needed, and it could do what needed to be done. And it drew inspiration from two historical examples. One was actually the Confederate Army in the Shenandoah Valley, particularly in 1862, when a relatively small Confederate Army in the US Civil War had won victories against a larger, more ponderous Union force. And the second example uh, was, of course, the Boers themselves, who, sm uh, small in number they may have been, nevertheless proved the fighting value of a small number of determined, uh, highly mobile soldiers. And the British, of course, worked hard to have this. This meant the British Army was mobile. It was fast-moving. It was light. It had a, a, a dedicated, fast wing. Its cavalry, which was somewhat overstrength relative to the rest of the army, and its assault tactics were based on combining fire and movement, as we've heard. Controlling this army required learning lessons about command and leadership, though. And one of the, the bitter experiences of the Boer War was that officers and men had frequently proved themselves unable or unwilling to use their initiative, which meant that bad mistakes were made, foolish mistakes were made, and opportunities were lost or even defeats were suffered. And we've already heard from Henry Colville talking about him witnessing uh, officers and men uh, simply stood on a ridge line because no one had told them to take cover. The army before the Boer War had begun to recognise that initiative in, in a confusing and chaotic battle would become necessary. But after the Boer War, or during the Boer War, and after it, it became quite clearly uh, simply essential to the development of the British Army. Because think back to the widely extended assault lines that are being employed. Officers would find it harder to control the men around them. They'll be out of voice range. Perhaps they wouldn't even hear whistles or shouts. The men themselves might be operating in small groups away from the, the steadying hand of an officer. Perhaps they'd be built, by, built around an NCO. And it was necessary in these engagements for officers and men to show both tactical initiative. So you can see one group is moving in fire and movement. You've got to provide covering fire. You can see another group is providing covering fire. You've got to move, for example. That was necessary. And also at a higher level, actually making command decisions, uh, making good decisions was important and could lead to opportunities being seized. Too often, particularly in the first year of the Boer War, the British Army showed a distinct lack of initiative and allowed opportunities to go begging or blundered into needless traps because people would blindly follow orders rather than actually using their own initiative to perhaps plot or employ a different approach. Mission command, as it's known now, largely unknown prior to the Boer War. But this changed during the conflict, and it was observed that the, the importance of skilled NCOs in keeping attacks going, it was observed that the best officers, those who survived the war and indeed survived being sacked during the war, there was a wave of sackings uh, and removal of officers for incompetence during the conflict, those who'd survived these purges uh, would go on to become skilled at making their own decisions and seizing opportunities. These were active, intelligent and in many ways, dynamic young officers, many of whom would go on, of course, to fame uh, and great importance in the First World War, as indeed are pictured here on your right. This concept of actually seizing the initiative and using the initiative, although it had been encouraged as early as 1896 in the British Army, it was truly codified, so put into unambiguous language in Combined Training 1902, which is the first British Army's um, training manual post-Boer War, and then it was uh, further exemplified in field service regulations. Combined training 1902 emphasized the absolute 
importance of officers making their own decisions, using their initiative to seize opportunities or to compensate for the confusion and chaos of the battlefield. Field service regulations actually went a step further and as well as acknowledging the absolute imperative of using initiative, it encoded the British Army with the idea of the authority of the man on the spot, whereby an officer who'd been ordered to do something which he realised was impossible and perhaps reflected the fact that the man who'd given him those orders wasn't aware of the situation, was able, legally in British terms, to disregard those orders and do something else instead. And if you feel service regulations went on further and suggested that an officer who simply blindly followed orders he could see were going to lead to disaster was doing a, a serious disservice to the military. So it really emphasised these points. And these points showed the British Army becoming more aware that battles were much more chaotic and fluid when modern weapons were involved. This was not the wars against the Zulus, Mardists, or indeed uh, many other colonial opponents where close control and tight order was necessary. In a battle with modern weapons and widely extended formations, chaos was the order of the day and it would require officers to make quick decisions uh, under strict time pressure to seize the opportunities and prevent the army stumbling into needless defeats and so the idea of using initiative and the, the underpinning concept the command and leadership had to be informed not by blind obedience but now by seizing the day and seizing opportunities this gradually became encoded into the british army itself and this led to the development of a subtle doctrine suitable for an experienced army the british um, doctrinal manuals were uh, and indeed if you look at them now are much broader and in some ways they're vague in some ways they offer more principles and suggestions than strict guidelines and indeed the army emphasized the fact there can't be a single assault formation because you don't know who you're going to end up fighting and I think this leads to a, a subtle doctrine or, as I've described elsewhere, an ethos, an understanding between within the army about how it's going to conduct itself, all of which was anchored on the idea of um, intelligent use of initiative in combat and, of course, using the tactics we've previously discussed, the fire and movement tactics and so on and so forth, to seize opportunities and offset problems. And the army itself, the officer corps, was indeed experienced. Striking feature of the army in 1914 is just how many officers have experience of the Boer War. The senior commanders of the BEF, Sir John French, Sir Douglas Haig, Sir Horace Smith Dorian, and even before Smith Dorian, Sir James Grierson, had all a greatly enhanced their reputations in the South African War. In some ways, they've made their reputations there, particularly French and Haig, who'd um, who'd really come uh, emerged as stars of that war. And that level of experience actually extended down, uh, certainly as far as the colonel level and perhaps a little lower. Of the 157 infantry battalions in the British Army in 1914, 138 were commanded by officers who had been under fire. And the vast majority of those officers had been under fire in the Boer War. And so at least they had some experience of facing modern weapons and the nature of battle that modern weapons produced. And it meant that grasping these concepts of use of initiative, seizing opportunities and tying them to fire movement came more naturally to the army because it was experienced. It had seen how this could be used and it had seen the necessity indeed of using this method. And yet no learning process is ever perfect. And undoubtedly there were lessons that were not learned in the British army and there were perhaps opportunities that were missed and I'm just going to briefly go over some of these for you now. One of the, the, the key things that it's easy to forget is that the army was under strict budgetary constraints. And in the era of the integrated defense review in the United Kingdom, it's easy to forget that uh, a, the, the balancing the books between the service arms is absolutely nothing new for the British military. In the Edwardian period, the Navy, the Royal Navy had overwhelmingly the lion's share of defence spending. The British Army initially had its budget cut after the end of the Boer War, and then its budget remained essentially static, which of course in real terms actually meant it was declining due to the nature of inflation. And everything the British Army did actually had to be built around strict budget constraints. So if it wanted one thing, it would often have to sacrifice another. So for example, 
as much as it wanted to add even more firepower to its uh, to its arsenal, uh, there simply wasn't the money to invest in these uh, in new weaponry. So the army had already equipped itself with new artillery. It had a new rifle. It had other other elements of new equipment, new cavalry sword, for example. And campaign from a small number of very dedicated campaigners to increase the machine gun allocation in the British army largely fell upon deaf ears, uh, largely for budgetary reasons. To bring in a whole new wave of machine guns was going to cost the British army a lot of money. And it was money it simply didn't have. Its budget was tightly controlled. And so this did lead to certain problems. And these problems could actually go wider. Budget constraints meant that there were limitations on what you could do in terms of training. Uh, Large-scale manoeuvres in particular were rather hampered by what was available in, in terms of land in which you could operate on. Um, live firing exercises, similarly limited. And other problems which were by the budget ultimately had the final say. And um, perhaps the most significant budgetary problem the British Army had, exemplified by Henry Wilson, the sub-chief of staff in 1914, and of course the man who was really the creator of the British Army's plans to go to France prior to the war, when he said there is no problem in military science, to which the answer is six divisions. And of course the British Army had six infantry divisions, uh, not because of its military importance or its military significance, but that was what it could afford. And the idea of expanding it in peacetime was simply was not possible. And so everything the army did had to have these budget constraints at the back of its mind. Furthermore, as I described elsewhere, the army had to remain flexible for a variety of threats. And it's easy for us because we know what is coming next for the army in the Edwardian period. We know that the First World War is just around the corner. The army itself did not know that. Even though there was a looming threat from Germany that grew greater and greater as this period went on, and the army certainly was very much aware of this threat, it could not guarantee its next great war would be against Germany. It might well be another great war somewhere around the British Empire, which, let's not forget, occupied a fifth of the inhabited globe uh, and was frequently a source of troubles. And so the army could not focus solely on European conflict. It had to remain flexible uh, for a variety of potential colonial clashes that could be wildly different from the type of war it had fought in South Africa. And this led, as you may know, Basil Little Hart, the soldier turned historian, controversial figure, it would describe the British Army of 1914 as the rapier amongst scythes. And I've described it elsewhere, not as a rapier amongst scythes, but instead a Swiss army knife amongst scythes, because it was an army that was designed to do everything, but at the same time could not do uh, one thing perhaps as well as its continental rivals. And this was a feature simply of the British Army uh, in this period. It could not overcome this. It had to be prepared for a wide range of eventualities. The final, uh, the, sorry, not the final point at all. The uh, second point was the fact that although training was the, of a high standard, no doubt, it still had its limitations uh, d diff difficulties in actually finding manoeuver grounds, uh, difficulties uh, for units stationed around the empire and often in inadequate um, areas for training uh, had played a role. And in particular, it was difficult to train in combined arms tactics. In the Boer War, the British artillery had proved itself very good at providing covering fire for the infantry. But training that in practice in, uh, in, in peacetime was much, much harder because you couldn't use live ammunition, of course, for obvious reasons. It was difficult to get the same effect with, um, with dummy rounds. And the artillery and the infantry rather drifted away from one another in this period. And combined arms, perhaps the most difficult aspect of any military operation, I won't say it, it was lost in the British Army, but it certainly declined. And the, the, this was a lesson of the Boer War that was understood, but perhaps was not fully grasped in this period. And there were other uh, problems with training, uh, occasional errors, mistakes, occasional regressive tendencies that were observable at various times. This is a dynamic and ongoing process, ladies and gentlemen. It is not a straight line of learning and training. And although fire and movement was the watchword, the balance between how much fire one required relative to movement and indeed vice versa, uh, would be contested and it would be argued over uh, during this period. I think the British Army had got it just about right by 1914 in that terms, but it went through a number of periods where it was a point for discussion.
And finally, command arrangements, that is to say higher command arrangements, remained uncertain. The spirit of initiative and seizing the initiative, combined with the fact that the British Army had to be prepared for a variety of deployments around the world, which might be relatively small scale, tended to encourage a little bit of a go-as-you-please approach to more senior command. And this was exemplified by the fact that of the six British infantry divisions, each of them tended to approach an assault in a slightly different way, in a slightly different, slightly different operating method, shall we say. And this caused some concern in the army, but it was rather brushed off by the army council on the grounds that in the event of the entire army being mobilised and going to war, the commander-in-chief, the designate, of course, being John French, hero of the Boer War, the commander-in-chief would impose his will on these formations. And that, I must say, was rather wishful thinking. And the army never really got to grips with exactly how its command arrangements would work. And practicing command arrangements was, in turn, hampered somewhat by limitations on manoeuvres, limitations on peacetime staff that you could have in a headquarters and so on. And it did lead to problems when the British Army finally went to war in 1914, where we see the army fighting very hard and showing all its tactical skills. But those tactical skills are perhaps not matched by the performance of its commanders in 1914. But of course, that's probably a topic for an entirely different lecture. I'm going to leave the final word uh, to this man, uh, Capt Captain Richard Munnitzhagen, a fascinating figure, um, remarkable man, may have exaggerated some of his exploits and may well have murdered his wife, uh, indeed, later in his life. A uh, contemporary of Lawrence of Arabia, which explains his a very striking outfit that he's wearing here, a tough colonial soldier. He was a young captain when the war broke out in August 1914. He was actually stationed in India, and he greeted the news of the war uh, with a typical sort of enthusiasm that one might associate with a warlike man, which he certainly was. And I've highlighted in bold and italics a pertinent passage from his diary written soon after he'd learned that Britain was at war with Germany. And he reflected from India, our expeditionary force is terribly small, but a mighty weapon for every soldier can shoot and every man is determined to fight. The Germans will soon find that out. The important part for me, we are not the soldiers of the South African war, but man for man, a great deal more efficient, better trained, better armed and better led than the German. We may debate the extent to which the British army was better than the Germans. Again, that may well be a talk for another day, but the important feature is Meinertz Hagen recognised that the British Army had undergone this significant development and were no longer the soldiers of the South African War. And if a, a tough, highly experienced veteran, as you would go on to be, can perceive that, I hope that I've made that case to you in this talk tonight. I'm going to end this with some suggested further reading, and I'm going to make absolutely full disclosure here that I have, of course, a stake in these books in one form or another. This talk is, in many ways, the, the condensed version, the greatly condensed version of an argument and indeed discussion I put forward in the book From Boer War to World War, the tactical reform of the British Army 1902 to 1914. And if you'd like to see the full extent of how the British Army changed in this period and direct linkages to the Boer War, of course, going into far, far more detail than I've been able to do in this talk, then I do encourage you to take a look at this book uh, available wherever good books are sold. And a really great companion piece to this uh, and it is the, the award-winning uh, Futile Exercise by Simon Batten, which is a really interesting uh, different side of the coin to the, this, the nature of tactics which I studied in From Boer War to World War, because uh, Simon looks at the nature of manoeuvres and the nature of organisation and, and how actual um, large-scale manoeuvres are carried out in Britain, all the difficulties they've faced and how eventually these were overcome. And my stake in this uh, excellent book is that I wrote the foreword to it, so I, I do have uh, some interest in it. And finally, if you'd like to see, um, and I've hinted at this, if you'd like to see how command and leadership fared from the experience of the Boer War into that a tremendously hard-fought August to November period in 1914, then I recommend to you the award-winning, again, uh, Stemming the Tide, Officers and Leadership in the British Expeditionary Force 1914, which is an edited book 
uh, 15 chapters, including two by myself, uh, and a, a galaxy of First World War experts, each looking at individual officers and how they performed in this tremendously hard fought, in, in many ways, desperate campaign in 1940. And Chapters, of course, explore the linkage between how the army had developed uh, both before the Boer War, during it, and in the intervening pre-First World War period. Uh, and uh, so if you're interested to seeing, well, how did this all culminate, I do recommend Stemming the Tide to You. And it's now available in a very natty uh, revised edition, which has a revised cover and a new introduction by myself. So if you're interested, do check it out. And if you're not prepared to actually pony up any money for these books, but you're still interested in, in looking into this in more depth, I would also I, I might point you in the direction of an article I wrote that's available via open access, so it's freely available to you from the internet. Uh, and this was an article called Shooting Power, a study of the effectiveness of Boer and British fire 1899 to 1914, which was published in the British Journal for Military History way back in its first issue in 2014. But if you type that title, into Google, uh, it will come up as one of the results and you can download a PDF of it for free and you can see about how rifle fire in particular was developed between the two powers and how the British copied uh, many of the Boer methods. Of course, I hope that my talk of fire and movement and so forth has piqued your interest sufficiently to perhaps invest in one of these fine tomes or at least examine the article. But regardless of all that, I'm very thankful for your attention and for your interest in this talk. And I'd be most grateful now. If you have any questions, uh, please do. Uh, I believe the, the protocol is to uh, uh, put them into the chat. So I'm sure David will correct me if I am wrong. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that we have time to cover. So thank you very much for your attention. Spencer, thanks ever so much indeed for that super talk. Um, it's full of enthusiasm, full of entertaining facts. And if I know everybody knows the routine already, but if you'd like to raise your hands as a virtual round of applause uh, for Spencer, for his talk, that would be um, great. And Spencer, I can confirm there's hundreds of hands going up as a virtual <laughs> a virtual round of applause there. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, you're quite, Spencer's quite right. It, it is Q&A time. And I can confirm that we have just got an absolute meltdown on Q&As. <laughs> so we don't stand an earthly of getting through these um, questions tonight. So I'm just grabbing the first uh, the, the first of the questionnaire questioners here, which is Trevor Harvey. Trevor uh, said, uh, Trevor asks, can the British Army just be justifiably criticised for the lack of speed it demonstrated in the rate at which it adopted and deployed the machine gun in the period between the late 1890s and 1914? That's, that's uh, Trevor Harvey's question. Well, thank you, Trevor. Um, yes, is the short answer. And uh, it's, it's one of those interesting problems the British Army has, because coming out of South Africa, there is a small group of officers who, are who have recognised the, the, the immense power of the machine gun and regard it as pivotal. pivotal. Perhaps the most prominent of these, or certainly the, the, one of the most political pull, is actually Lord Kitchener's brother, Walter, who argues very strongly that machine guns are going to completely redefine the First World War. Uh, Walter, of course, dies before the First World War, so he can't carry this on. But his mantle, the mantle is taken up by other officers, uh, notably Walter Congreve, VC, again, another veteran of the Boer War, and also... Um, later on by Norman McMahon, who becomes the head of the School of Musketry and argues very strongly for it. These men who are campaigning strongly for machine guns are, run into two problems. Uh, one of the big problems is it's very difficult to replicate what a machine gun does in training. Uh, it doesn't have blank ammunition until very late in this period, so it can't really simulate its fire, um, and so it's not really used very much. And secondly, of course, there's the budgetary constraints. And McMahon argues very strongly, this is Norman McMahon, who's um, in charge of the School of Musketry for a time, that the machine gun allocation just has to be increased. But he runs into budgetary concerns, and he's also stymied in many ways by the fact the army points out that, you know, this is going to cost a lot of money. Do you really want machine guns uh, going up the mountains of Afghanistan and, and so on and so forth? So it can be justifiably criticised. In, in the Army's defence, the machine gun had not come out of the Boer War with a 
unambiguous reputation. Machine guns had had problems in the Boer War. They were a cruder design than those we'd see in 1914, quite often wheeled and easy targets. And uh, machine guns had not covered themselves in glory uh, in many engagements in South Africa. Nevertheless, I think it's a justifiable criticism. And if we were to uh, call upon the spirits of Walter Congreve and indeed Walter Gitchener, uh, they would absolutely agree that this was an opportunity missed and the cost for this missed opportunity was paid in 1914 and indeed beyond. Great. Thanks, Thanks for that. Thanks for answering uh, Trevor's question there. Greg, do you want to mute yourself there, Greg? Thanks, thanks, Spencer, for a fascinating talk. I have already read Futile Exercise. I made a note of the From Boer War to World War to put it on my reading list. Um, <clears throat> something else I've recently read is um, Sir William Robertson's uh, memoirs uh, from Private to Field Marshal. Uh, and in there, he talks about uh, the situation during the advance to Bloemfontein, uh, where he thought that tactics suffered from a desire on the part of the high command to avoid casualties. He said he, this caused commanders to hesitate when they should have showed determination and boldness. I just wondered whether you thought that that might have coloured the, the view of uh, more than just um, Sir William Robinson, but other mid-ranking officers uh, in their view of how the Boer War was conducted, mm. that might then have coloured their, their approach during the First World War, certainly the early stages of the First World War. Mm. It's, it certainly was an attitude that was reflected, I think, in parts of the British Army in, in that particular, in particularly in that period. So, for example, we, we read of Douglas Hay complaining about He's commanding troops who just get bogged down in firefights at long ranges with the Boers and they won't go forward. And certainly the, the approach during the advance of Longfontaine, which is February, March 1900, is characterised by big, wide flanking manoeuvres and holding forces to just try and distract the Boers rather than actually assault them to their position. And what this means is that aside from the encirclement of Paderberg, which is quite unusual, the Boers frequently fall back and they fall back and they fall back. And the advances slowed down and the Boers uh, retained significant force in the field that later become guerrilla uh, guerrilla forces. And so this view that, that, that more risks could be run and, and more um, more could be done is it does find favour within mid-ranking British Army officers. The counterpoint to this, of course, is the British Army has had really bruising encounters with the Boers. In the, uh, in, in the months prior to this advance. So this is occurring in sort of February, March 1900. Let's not forget that in November, December 1899, there was plenty of determination for the British to take casualty or run the risk of taking casualties. And my goodness, they had taken those casualties and they hadn't got anywhere either. So Robertson has a point and that point was reflected by mid-ranking officers. But I think it has to be moderated by the fact that the army had had bruising experiences prior to this. I'll add a further point to that, and that is that the Germans, who were, of course, observing this war, would have agreed with Robertson. The Germans were surprised at the lack of willingness the British showed to just take enormous casualties in the pursuit of victory. Now, this isn't casualties for the sake of it, of course, but the Germans thought the war could have, just like Robertson, thought the war could have been ended much sooner if the British had been willing to push through, take heavy losses, uh, and just simply grind through the Boers. And the British regarded this German attitude with, with sort of derision, to be quite honest, and almost a sense of, well, you try it. But remember, the Germans are coming from a, a, an experience of mass warfare, much larger armies, and their most recent war experience was the Franco-Prussian War, which was very bloody indeed. So this attitude has to be moderated by the experience prior to 1900. But to answer your question, it was one that was found quite widely amongst uh, middle-ranking British officers at this time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. Um, Angela, um, I know you've got a couple of questions in there, but if you can uh, ask the second of yours there, Angela, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Um, you mentioned about the state of the cavalry horses in the Boer War. Um, they were in a very poor state. Now, do you know much about how the conditions of transport to Africa i.e. shipping them to Africa, would have affected their condition once they arrived there? Uh, extremely poorly is the, is the answer. It's a long journey. Uh, as you cross, you know, you get close to Africa, the, the horse transporting ships are very hot. 
they often weren't properly looked after uh, in the sense of uh, their feed wasn't quite right. And crucially, they didn't have opportunity to exercise. When you're being shipped into South Africa, the horses are going to lose their conditioning. And then what really compounds it is the horses arrive in South Africa at various points. Port um, uh, East London and Port Elizabeth are, are the main sort of depots for horses arriving. And they're, they're not given any time to acclimatize to either the South African heat or to regain their conditioning. Instead, they're just very quickly uh, got off the ship, piled into trains, and rushed up to the front line and de de um, yeah, then redeployed mm -hmm. to the uh, to the cavalry or the mounted infantry. And it leads to, from the, 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 I've seen the statistic mentioned, that the average life expectancy of a horse was about six weeks from the moment it arrived in South Africa to the moment, of course, it perished. And a lot of this is owed to the fact there was no acclimatization period, no attempt to um, refit or, or regain the fitness of the horses. Instead, the, these poor beasts were just thrown into action. Uh, again and again and again so it took a long time for the army to to get to grips with that eventually it did but mm. it wasn't until really the, uh, the the latter stages of the war that it started to have a properly organized remount system up until then it was just simply throwing horses at the problem rather than actually addressing trying to keep its horses alive in the field oh, that's great thank you thanks angela thanks for your question there thank you Robin, uh, your, your your question. You, you're asking this for, for a couple of people, yourself and uh, Ian Wallace, I'll name check, uh, as somebody who's uh, also asked a very similar question to yours. So off you go, Robin. I thought others might as well. Spencer, first of all, it's a delight to see uh, a lecturer in these series wearing a jacket and tie. It's most <laughs> unusual. Um, and can I uh, also say what a marvellous book I thought Stemming the Tide was. The collection of essays were absolutely tremendous. And I, as were the following two volumes, and I hope that the um, 1917 and 18 volumes will one day see the light of day. My question was coming from somebody who was in the army and wore a green jacket is that the idea of fire and manoeuvre is not new. Uh, it goes back to the Napoleonic Wars. Indeed, I suspect it goes back further, back to the American War of Independence. So fire and manoeuvre for certain regiments has always been part of their daily life. Um, and I would suggest, therefore, that what you see after the Boer War is the, the ideas that, <laughs> careful what I say, advanced infantry regiments good thinking infantry regiments have always used and they are spreading to the rest of the army. Mm. I think that's that's a fair argument, Robin. And I would just expand on that a little bit. And um, this is that fire and movement was known in parts of the army as it went to South Africa. And particularly those units who'd fought on the northwest frontier of, of India, of course, the modern Afghan-Pakistan border, where there was mountain fighting and hill fighting against well-armed Afghan opponents. They'd learned the importance of using fire and movement to advance into difficult terrain. The problem the army had prior to the Boer War was that if you were good at something, and you, you've hinted at it a little bit here, if you were good at something as a battalion, you did not share it with the wider army. It became a sort of trade secret. And this was particularly apparent for units that had gone through that brutal proving school up on the northwest frontier. They didn't share this information, even with other units coming onto the frontier. There was a certain perverse pride about, well, we're elite. You're going to have to learn the hard way, gentlemen. And we even see this in some of the early battles in the Boer War. So to go back to Graspan, which I just quote, which I mentioned right at the start with Phillips uh, talking about it's a march into um, waiting Boer rifles, which in many ways it was. But even there, there are some battalions who have come from uh, have recently been on the northwest frontier, and they go forward in a much more fire and movement skirmishing style. But battalions right next to them are advancing shoulder to shoulder uh, and are getting shot to pieces as they go forward. And that captures something of the inconsistency of this. So if you'd learned how to use fire and movement, that was your secret and you kept it. And as you say, certain specialist units, light infantry and rifles and so forth, were very proud of this. But of course, it became standard now for the entire army and it was written hardwired into into British army tactics but it's it allows me to explore this idea about the, the the idiosyncrasies of the British army and that unwillingness to share information and one of the key things about the Boer War is almost the entire British regular army goes through the, the Boer War at some point and so everybody gets a chance to learn I mean it's, it's a brutal school very very hard way of learning your lessons but it means that those lessons can't be ignored they're not going to be the preserve of um uh, of just elite specialist units anymore. But it's a good point, Robin, and thank you very much for the comments as well about Stem in the Tide. And the, the other books will be following, I assure you. Delighted. <laughs>
Thanks, Robin. Thanks a lot. Mark Thomas, Matt, do you want to just unmute yourself there? There we go. Uh, thank you, Spencer. Excellent lecture. Um, I was wondering if the, uh, the British military establishment, while it was in soul searching and um, reflective mode, ever considered uh, what was going on in the Russo-Japanese war? That's a great question, uh, Mark, because the answer is yes. In fact, the, the British Army sent more observers to the Russo-Japanese war uh, than it had done for any war previously uh, up to that point. It was fascinated with the Russia-Japanese war. Of course, there were elements to this. One, Russia was a, an enemy of Britain at the time, or was perceived as an enemy, and Japan was an ally, so it was quite keen to see what was going on. Observations of the Russia-Japanese war are, are really interesting. The most prominent and famed observer, Ian Hamilton, who, of course, would later come to grief at uh, Gallipoli, and Hamilton mm -hmm. published edited versions of his uh, observations of the, uh, the Russia-Japanese war in two volumes called a staff officer's scrapbook, which I believe are available online if you're interested. The observations of the Russia-Japanese war are very interesting because the British tended to see confirmation of the lessons of the Boer War. So the overwhelming importance of firepower, for example, the necessity of entrenching, especially if there was enemy artillery, uh, the necessity of widely extended tactics. And the British actually took a sort of perverse pride because the Japanese army had based itself largely on the German army, which tended to emphasize, or at least in Japanese mind, tended to emphasize quite close formations. And these close formations ran into grief in the early part of the Russia-Japanese war. And the Japanese soon turned them into extended ones, much to the satisfaction of British observers. One of the features, though, in general, the Russo-Japanese war, and this is true of French and German observer observers in the conflict, is it tended to confirm existing lines of thought. So the Germans saw... Uh, proof of their own belief and their own lessons in the uh, the Russia-Japanese war, just as the British did. And so nothing very revolutionary came out of observing the war, but a, a lot of confirmation of existing lessons came from it. And for a time, the Russia-Japanese war became the dominant way of thinking about war in the British army. But that's mm -hmm. actually a relatively short space of time. It had largely faded away by about 1908 and had been, uh, had, had been replaced. It sort of flared briefly in the British army's imagination. And then they returned back to the, the standard approach to tactics they had, which, of course, they believed the lessons of the uh, Russia-Japanese war had confirmed. OK, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Um, Brian, do you want to unmute yourself there? Spencer, good evening. Hello, Brian. Um, just going back to 1899, had we not learned any lessons from the experience of fighting in Afghanistan? in 1878, 1880, or were these more, because that was obviously the Indian Army, were these more Indian Army lessons that weren't passed back to the British Army that went to South Africa? I, I guess I'm thinking particularly of the way we had to apparently relearn to fight in a skirmishing fashion. Well, this, this goes back to the, the comment, the answer I gave earlier, and that this is that there were lessons learned, and there were um, British battalions who'd fought on the North frontier, who ended up in South Africa and used the tactics they'd learned. But it speaks too about that the strange, somewhat uh, institutionalized nature of the British army, where individual battalions were almost their own personal kingdoms. And there was no system in the British army prior to the Boer War, whereby you could share lessons that went beyond the theatre that you were in. So let, um, tr troops on the northwest frontier of India did have tactical advice, which they could draw upon, printed tactical advice, but it never went anywhere beyond that. So although it was clearly useful uh, for the British army in South Africa, there was no way of distributing. There was no system of sharing lessons from theatre to theatre, at least no formal system. There were informal attempts, publications in Rusi and um, or the Royal United Service Journal, as it was then, United Service Magazine and so on. But these were informal things, and it was largely a matter of luck if the army picked them up. And I, I would also add that we can go back a little bit further than the, um, the war in the Northwest frontier and say, well, what about the lessons of the first Boer War? Because of course the British had had a bruising encounter there. Ian Hamilton, who we've already heard about, uh, he'd fought in the first Boer War and he wrote a book about it called Fighting of the Future. And actually when Hamilton had the opportunity to put some of his ideas into action in the early stages of the Boer War, he quickly employed skirmish lines and uh, widely extended order, covering fire and so on, because he'd been thinking about how to do this for almost 20 years since his first uh, bruising encounter with the Boers in 1880 and 81. And yet, in terms of sharing those lessons or drawing upon them, 
there was no system which could do it. And so we end up with certain uh, regiments and battalions that have that experience and they use it and they're, they're keen to use it, but they've got no capacity to share it. And I would argue they also had no real interest in sharing it uh, laterally from unit to unit. And um, that, that's a sort of flaw of the army that's recognized after the Boer War, that people regard these things as trade secrets and that that's going to have to change in the future. And, and to the credit of the army, it does indeed change. Great. OK, thanks for your question there, Brian. Um, Chris, Chris, um, do you want to just fire in your question there? Thanks, a great, uh, great talk. That's my first real introduction to the Boer War. My reading about it's only been fairly superficial before. But one of the common um, common uh, criticisms I see the British approach is that we created the concept of the concentration camp. What gave rise to that? Was it military expediency or a general concern for the welfare of the civilian uh, elements? Well, it's, a, it's a huge question and a long one. And to give a full answer would probably need another entire lecture. <laughs> the, the British had, in, the, the initial concentration camps, and this is something that's largely been forgotten to history. The initial concentration camps were to house Boer refugees who were in danger of, being, of facing recriminations from other Boers. So these were Boers who had surrendered to the British. And the initial surrender uh, approach to the, 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 uh, the British Army took was you would surrender your firearm as a Boer and you would sign a document uh, promising you would not take up arms against the British government again. And then you could, we were allowed to go home. Now, many Boers ended up ignoring those surrender documents and would go back into the guerrilla war, but others wanted to abide by them. And Boer males in particular who had surrendered and weren't willing to fight were at risk of reprisal attacks from other, other Boers who wanted to continue fighting. So initially, the concentration camps were refugee camps to house these displaced Boers. But then, of course, the British start to adopt on an ever-growing scale a scorched earth approach, destroying towns and villages and throwing women, children and the elderly out onto the, the veldt, initially in the hope that these civilians will attach themselves to Boer commandos and slow them down. A pretty callous approach. But of course, that doesn't happen. And instead, you've got lots of civilians stranded in the wilderness at grave risk. And so the British start to house them in refugee camps. And a word about concentration camps, because of course we think of concentration camps in terms of Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s. And the comparison, apart from name, the comparison should be dismissed because to the British, a concentration camp was essentially a combination of a refugee camp and an internment camp for displaced Boer civilians. For the Germans, for the Nazis, a concentration camp was deliberately designed to kill, degrade, punish, uh, and ultimately erode your, your, your will to live. The British camps were not designed to do that. That they ended up doing this and that there were terrible disease outbreaks and, of course, very demoralising just to be trapped in, in one of these camps mm. was largely due to incompetence. The British didn't administer them properly, cited them badly, didn't equip them properly, and then due to a certain amount of callousness that when problems emerged there, particularly disease outbreaks, the British moved very slowly to address them. And it was only as a British press scandal began to get wind of this, driven, of course, by the indefatigable Emily Hobhouse, who largely broke the story mm. in Britain, uh, that suddenly the British army thought, Croke, you've got to do something about this, and started to, to get its ideas back together. And so the comparison between the two is a very dangerous one to make. It's a very easy one to make because, of course, the names are the same, but they are int yeah. their intentions were entirely different. And the German, the, the German use of camps was designed to punish and hurt and, and kill, in fact, whereas the British camps were ultimately designed to, as a form of prison camp, but not intended to uh, cause the, the level of suffering they ended up doing. That they did was as much due to encompassed incompetence and callousness rather than any deliberate okay. intent. I could say a great deal more about this, but that's the summary answer for you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks for your question there, Chris. Um, there's a, a question from Simon Shepherd, um, who asks, um, why did the Royal Artillery not learn the lesson, lessons of Colenso and as a result still try to deliver their fire directly and thus exposed rather than indirectly at the beginning of the First World War? I think the... The example, and I think the example you're thinking of, Simon, is, of course, the Battle of Le Cateau on the 26th of August, 1914, where the Royal Artillery loses uh, 38 guns, a uh, terrible loss of, of artillery firepower. Um, 
the artillery had gone through a terrific debate uh, between the Boer War and up to the First World War about how best to deliver fire. And it swung one way or another, with some artillerymen saying, well, the infantry are going to be inspired by the sight of our guns going into action. They're going to want to see us nearby them, and it's going to encourage them. Other gunners saying, no, that's a disaster. It's going to draw fire onto, the, onto our batteries, and the infantry are going to be discouraged if they see the batteries getting smashed and knocked out. And this debate went on in the, the um, pre-First World War period, and largely it had settled in favour of fighting from covered positions. But in the extremely confusing and intense battles of August and, and indeed in September 1914, uh, particularly Lakato, I think Lakato is a really unusual example where the army is in a very disorganised state, the stakes are unimaginably high, there's some confusion about whether the army is trying to fight a a significant rear guard, or if it's going to the, it's going to be the last man and the last bullet. And there's some controversy and confusion about taking up positions at that battle. Um, the art, what I will say is, of course, the artillery never does it again on that kind of scale. They recognize this was a, a severe error. But even at Le Cateau, although 5th Division's artillery mainly goes into forward positions, the other two infantry divisions, 3rd and 4th, generally don't. They actually fight from covered positions. So even at this, uh, the most devastating early battle for the Royal Artillery, the experience, I think, is largely fighting from covered positions. Uh, and of course, the reasons for that are not far to, to, to find. If you fight in the open, you're going to be marked down and you're going to be smashed by the German gunners. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. So uh, th thanks, Spencer. The very last question, I know there's loads more questions, and I apologise to everybody, but we just can't carry on until midnight is <laughs> what would be needed I'll, I'll leave the last question to, to steve warburton um, who asks and i'll get not i'll just ask the, for him just to speed things up how significantly did lessons from the ball war feature in the staff college curriculum before the first world war that's from steve warburton this is slightly surprising in that exact actual examples of the ball war um, were a little bit late getting into the staff college curriculum. Um, there was still a, a focus upon looking at things like the American Civil War, right up to the First World War. And study of the, the um, battles of the, of the Boer War was considered a little bit uh, controversial in the staff college days because you might end up critiquing an officer who was still serving. Um, and that's got, ooh, that's got problems in staff college days prior to the First World War. So rather than looking at specific examples, uh, specific battles and critiquing them, there were of various sort of fictional scenarios that were based upon incidents that it would occur in the Boer War. So they were incorporated, but perhaps not as much as you might think in terms of studying history, because the Boer War was so recent, uh, there was a tendency to study older wars for, for deeper lessons. But that was compensated by the fact that the nature of training uh, in general drew upon all these Boer War lessons. And so although at Staff College you might not be taught exactly what happened in the Boer War, uh, there were plenty of places you go to find that out. The publishing industry boomed about uh, the Boer War in the immediate aftermath. And there were hundreds of books published on it, and not to mention magazine articles and so on. So you could certainly read up on it. But the training exercise at Staff College at least exemplified the lessons that have been learned from the Boer War, even if they didn't cite the exact examples which they were, they were drawing upon. And this just reminds me of something that I, I'd like to end, uh, and I know we appreciate we're coming to the end of the... the Q&A. And this is a thought to leave you with. It's dawned on me just as we were speaking that we talk a lot in the, uh, in the study of the First World War about the learning process or the learning curve, if you prefer. The idea that the British Army gradually learned how to fight the First World War, how to fight a mass industrial war, until by 1918 it had become a very formidable fighting force, which played a key role in breaking the German army. And quite often the learning process is seen as starting at the Somme, when of course the mass citizen army goes into action uh, from a very uh, low base of training and it has to learn hard lessons. I think, in fact, we can argue the learning process doesn't start in 1916. It doesn't even start in 1914. It actually starts in 1899. And that to understand the development of the British Army, it, we need to look a little bit beyond just the First World War. And the learning curve, the learning process begins in 1899. And it's a rocky road. There's highs, there's lows, there's false leads, there's things that don't go, um, don't go correctly. But as Richard Meinrat's Hagen quote that I ended with, shows the army had advanced enormously from 1899 to 1914 and it would advance enormously again from 1914 
to 1982. So let's perhaps think about the learning process as being a much broader process than we tend to think of. I'll leave that with you as the final thought. I think that's an excellent point on which to, to end tonight's uh, superb um, webinar from Spencer Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd invite everybody to once again um, raise your hands uh, on Zoom as a, as a virtual um, round of applause for Spencer and that absolute stunning presentation that we've just uh, listened to and, and seen uh, tonight. So Spencer, there's hundreds of hands going up as a, as a silent but nevertheless heartfelt round of applause from, from, from our members who are, who are uh, enjoying who enjoyed that tonight. Um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll just leave it with everybody um, to say if you do enjoy these um, webinars please do ensure that you register nice and early but above all if you are unable to, to attend if you can just cancel any registrations if you're unable to attend any future ones I know I'm speaking to people here who have uh, 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 registered and indeed attended so it's slightly inaccurate for me to, 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 to talk to, to everybody to say cancel when you, when you are watching but we, we do sometimes get a, a few uh, drop-offs um, before the, the, the talks start um, but anyway that's that's all from me tonight that's all from Spencer Spencer fr from me that's uh, been a wonderful talk uh, and I, I can't wait for when we uh, book you for a, a future one which I'm sure we will Thank you very much, David, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks very much, and good evening to everybody, and please stay safe. Good night. Mademoiselle from Armentier.